What's that, Trapper? Seven? You say seven near-death experiences? What are you up to, man? Well, let me explain how this started. A few months back, my son came to me and he said, Oh, Father, Father. He's very formal about things. And I said, Yes, my beloved son. My only beloved. Isn't that biblical? I think so. Anyway, uh, so uh, he says, uh, There's something trendy going on in podcasting. I said, Well, I'm all about trendy. You know that. So he said, well, what some uh, podcasters are doing is if they have a, a lot of content, maybe there's a particular topic in which there are several episodes and people are just stringing them together for one episode, like hours of content in some cases. I said, really? People are watching or listening to this stuff? He says, yeah, yeah. So I thought, okay, so for us, something like angel encounters or near-death experiences, he says, that's, that's, that would be trendy, Dad, Father, oh, Father. And uh, I thought, okay, well, uh, good to know, kind of, you know, file it away. And then, uh, did I get a sign? <laughs> I've been kind of, I've been pondering it now and then. And then, then this week, I got kind of a near-death experience sign, and it came through a song. You know, songs bubble up in my head, seemingly out of nowhere, but we know where that nowhere is. Uh, one morning, I woke up, and this song just kept playing. Beatles song, "I'm Looking Through You," and I'm thinking, wait a minute, that was in a movie. Somebody used that in a movie. Some of that ghosts looked it up. Sure enough, 2008. It's called Ghost Town. Ricky Gervais, Greg Kinnear. Uh, in the movie, uh, Ricky Gervais plays a dentist, a very arrogant, egotistical, self-centered, jerk of a guy dentist. And what does he have? I forgot all about this. He had a near-death experience. He died for seven minutes, has an experience, and it changes him. Suddenly, he starts going from jerk to nice guy. And, of course, near-death experience uh, they're all about change. The before and after, in some cases, is phenomenal. We have, we have. I'm bringing back Howard Storm. I haven't played this for a long, long time. Probably the most celebrated near-death experience out there, and and others as well. I want you to check out some of these. We haven't run for quite some time, but together, it's quite a body of work. And again, going back to this conversion change that happens often with near-death experiences, and of course, the life review and everything that happens. So cool. So, oh, and Ricky Gervais. This is kind of interesting. Uh, you know he's an atheist? He is. And uh, I saw him on a talk show, and he said something kind of funny. He said, well, there's really not that much difference between you believers and me. He says, you believe in a God. You believe in one God. I just believe in zero gods. The difference between one and zero, very close. So let's see the change that does happen in these seven near-death experiences here on Touched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. Every sin that I committed in my life, they were flushed before my eyes. Everyone. So I was 100% sure that this is the last day of my life. The Lord is not going to spare me. Sandy, a Hindu. So when you're in the afterlife, you're not expecting to bump into Jesus. Yes, I was. I grew up as a Hindu, and my parents were very conservative Hindus. Like mm -hmm. they were, my father was a Hindu priest and very well renowned scholar. My real name is Santos, but they've been calling me Sandy now. I would say at least fifty-five years. How long you been in the U.S.? I've been in the U.S. since nineteen ninety-two. Okay, but before then, I was in Canada for another twenty-five years. I can tell by your Canadian accent. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and we should and we should say with with Hindu, what do they call it? Poly, poly, theo, uh, lots of gods, right? Well, not only that, they also believe that you know you don't know when you're going to get liberated from this life. You know, from one life to the another life is entirely up to God. And I never paid any attention to all these, you know. Uh, the afterlife and all these things, because they're not important to me. My importance was to make money. And then something I'm told happened. It happened all of a sudden. I, everything was going good for me. 2006, October, I have a severe pain in my chest and abdomen. It was such an excruciating pain that I never experienced before. My doctor came to me. I have some good news and some bad news for you because my pulse rate was 202. I said, tell me the good news first because I've been waiting. Good news is you don't have any heart attack. You have a severe gallbladder attack. As a result, 
your pancreas is bleeding. It's continuously bleeding. Because you're losing blood, the heart is trying to overcompensate and is pumping more. It's pumping more. What can you do? Then he said to me, that's the bad news. There is no medication or no procedure for that kind of thing that can stop the bleeding pancreas. And the doctor said, I'm sorry. There's nothing we can do. All you can do is pray and hope. And I don't know how to pray and to whom to pray. And that night, I have a new problem. I could not breathe at all. I could not breathe. It felt like a big giant elephant or a freight train was sitting on top of my chest. I collapsed in the hospital. I died. My life did not end with the death of my physical body. I see myself in the dead body, but then I discovered at that moment that my life did not end with the death of my body. Okay? Physically, I am dead, but my life continues. Okay? My immediate reaction was, what shall I do? I lost my home. What am I going to do? And then at that moment, I saw bright light appear before me. And the light, when it came to me, towards me, I knew that light has superior authority. I have to obey that light. I, nobody told me that, but I had to know. I, I immediately knew that that light has superior power. I have to obey his whatever is trying to do or telling me. It took me, like engulfed me with the radiance of the light. So because the light got so bright, I could not see anything else. I only see that light in front of me, ahead of me. Nothing else was visible. And then together we traveled for, I don't know how long, at a tremendous speed. And sometimes it felt like we go th went through some dark tunnel. It's trying to take me someplace, okay? But during the transition, I fell in love with that, the divine light that was taking me there. And at the end of the journey, I saw the light stopped. And then when I looked, I saw that it stopped on top of a huge compound. And I am standing on a platform outside this compound. So I am on a huge platform that's about thousand feet long, roughly and about 250 wide. I'm looking towards the heaven. So I'm on this side of the heaven. How do I know it's heaven? Because I have seen numerous angels, numerous. And I've seen like beautiful buildings, They're magnificent buildings, mansions after mansions after mansions. Okay. I've heard that everything is alive. Everything is alive. So when you even say buildings, in some way, shape, or form, it's alive. It's like you, it's like mansions. Living, living mansions. Living mansions, yeah. It's hard to living. comprehend that, that something has life, that everything has life, but everything has <laughs> life. Everything has life. But also, I also seen some people there, some human beings. Anybody you know? That was my first reaction, is to see if my father or my mother were there because I knew they were very, very strict, pious Hindus. If anyone from Hindu religion should be there, it would be my mother and my father. I did not see them. That really, you know, saddened me. And even today, as I recall, I, I feel sad. I was desperately trying to enter into that compound because I knew if I could enter into that company, the my goal of my life is fulfilled. This is my this is my what should be my priority is to how to get inside the compound because if I get in there, I'll be liberated. And I was trying to get inside that compound 
I looked all around it several times. I saw 12 magnificent gates, 12. I counted them, but not a single one was open for me, not even one. And I looked at my down below, I see is a lake of burning flames. That's the only light was visible. There was no other, no other light was there, deep down there. It was so scary. I'm hearing the symbolism, buddy. I'm hearing the symbolism that you're on the edge. Which way are you going? Yeah. Yeah. I have no other place to go. I desperately want to go forward, but I can't because the gates are not open. At that moment, I looked at this, you know, on the platforms where I was standing towards the center of the platform. And I saw there is a huge, there's an altar. And on top of the third step that I see there's an, like a little, like an altar. And on that altar, there's like a huge throne. And I see there, lo and behold, there was the Lord Almighty sitting there. I did not know at the time, is it Jesus? I only knew that he is the Lord Almighty. Nobody need to introduce him to me because I knew that the Lord Almighty is there and he's on the judgment seat, okay, right there. I saw his, look at his face once, but I could not look at the second time because I was so afraid. I started to shake and tremble because I knew the Lord is not going to spare me because I have committed so many sins or wrongdoings in my life that he is not going to spare me. At that moment, every sin that I committed in my life, they were flushed before my eyes. Everyone. So I was 100% sure that this is the last day of my life. The Lord is not going to spare me. But I kept saying the same words over and over. Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please forgive me. Please have mercy on me. I kept repeating the same words over and over. At that time, the Lord spoke to me. I could hear in any of the languages that I know. I know several languages now. I could understand any of the languages, but he was speaking through me from heart to heart, from his heart to my heart. But I knew that would be the end of my life. And when he spoke to me, I found that his voice was full of compassion, full of mercy, full of love. He said, what are you doing here? I did not answer. He said, I am sending you back to the earth. Your time has not come yet. I'll see you next time. Go back and complete your unfinished tasks. When the time comes, I will see you again. As he was talking to me, on his left side, there is a narrow door, very narrow door was open. And through that narrow door, I could see the entire kingdom of the heaven. And that was the only way I could get into the kingdom of heaven. There was no other way. The narrow gate, so to speak. Narrow gate, narrow, narrow gate. So the Lord, please forgive me. When I go back to the earth, please tell me which church I should go to, which temple, which mosque, which synagogue you want me to join, I'll go and join. But please tell me, how can I go to this narrow door when I, when I see you, when you see me next time? The Lord did not respond. I continued begging. Lord, when I go back, I'll be the same thing. I'll make the same mistakes. Please tell me what I need to do. What should I do? He still did not respond. Then I thought any moment he's going to be sending me back to the earth. And I said, Lord, please have mercy on me. 
please tell me what I need to do. I want to go next time you see me, I want to go to this narrow door. And the Lord finally answered. And we spoke for several, I don't know how long, it seems to be quite lengthy conversations we had. And he said to me, I am looking for an honest relationship with you, a sincere relationship, a true relationship. He said, I want you to be true, sincere, and honest with me all the time, not just once a week or twice a week or three times a year or whatever it is, all the time. I said, Lord, I am a simple human being. I do not understand any. Please tell me what I need to do. He said, when you are back to your family, it's like a commandment. He said, I want you to love your family and love your children. I said, Lord, I love my family and love my children. He said, no, I want you to love your family and love your children. At the time, I did not understand it, but now I do. I did not love my family and love my children the way he wants me. I was more like selfish, self-centered. I do not like, I did not love them the way he wants me to. And then he said, I'll give you some specific instructions. What do you need to do? I said, okay. First instruction, he said, always tell the truth. He said, always tell the truth. Some people, when they hear the truth, they will ridicule upon you, but you must always tell the truth. They the may, truth they now, may ridicule you, what'd you say? They may ridicule you? But you must always tell the truth. That has two meanings for me. First meaning is do not lie. The second meaning is Truth means what is happening here. What are you witnessing on your front, What in front of you? What are you witnessing on your left? What are you witnessing the conversation between him and me? Tell the truth. He wants us to share this information that yes, everyone, regardless of the religion, they will stand where I stood on the judgment seat. And there will be only two choices, either go forward through the narrow door or dive into your left into the burning lake of fire on my left. You cannot go back where you came from. That's, that doesn't happen. So that was the first lesson, first commandment or instruction that he gave me. The second one, he said to me, the wages of sin is death. From this day on forward, he said, commit no more sins. So I take it that at that moment, he forgave me all those sins that I committed up to that point. He's saying from this day on forward, do not commit any more sins because the wages of sin is death. And you now had a new awareness that you didn't have before. You're getting a fresh start, you believe. I did not understand what that means. Mm. And then to the next instruction that he gave me, surrender yourself completely, completely should be underlined unto me in your daily life. In other words, he's asking me to make him the driver in my life. The next one, I was totally lost. The next instruction that he gave me is walk with me. Now, I am a simple, I'm a small guy. I'm, I have my, I'm five foot six inches tall. And the Lord, when he's speaking to me at the time, he appeared to me about in the sitting position, he was about 35, 40 feet. So if he stands up, he'll be at least 70 feet tall. So I did not understand the meaning of it at all. I said, how can I walk with him? 
I was totally confused. He meant by that is walk with me means walk in the direction that he wants to go. And then finally he said, always help the poor, be kind to the poor, be generous to the poor. I said, Lord, I'll do that. I'll help the poor. But the poverty in this world is many. There's so many. I said, always be generous. Be generous to the poor. When you say help the poor, people automatically think they need the financial help only. Not so. People could be poor physically. They could be mentally poor. They could be emotionally poor. They could be educationally poor. They could be poor in many ways. Our job is to help them wherever we could. But I think the more I dig into it, now I know in today's world, as I see, most people are spiritually poor. Majority of them spiritually poor. They do not know. Even if I go to the church, I do not know the Lord. He wants us to be an intimate friend, intimate relationship with him, father and child relationship, honest relationship, true relationship. That's what he's looking at. We spoke for a length of time in a nutshell. That's what transpired. Okay, so you were at a commission there for about three days, then you came to, ultimately. I saw a motherly type nurse, a very kind, loving hearted nurse is looking at me. And she said, oh my goodness, you're back here. We're so all anxiously waiting for you to wake up. Thank God that you're back. I asked her, where am I? What is this place? I was just talking to speaking to God. And what, where is this place? Within a few days, they did the gallstone surgery. They had to remove the gallstones. They took me to the operation room. After that, I just walked out of the hospital without any medication or anything. And everyone was surprised. Even the doctors, they said, how could that be possible? At what point do you start looking at what you just experienced and start reevaluating everything in your life? I mean, you just, you just had a heart to heart. Did you figure out right, right away it was Jesus? Did that take a while? No, no, no. no I, he also gave me a couple of instructions that I did not mention to you. Okay, what are they? So there was some instruction for me that when I get back to my family, he wants me to write two books. And the first book he wants me to write as soon as I get on my feet, just write what actually happened from the beginning to this point, what actually happened. Every night, whatever I wanted to write, it came out by itself, as if he was writing it through me. First book, when they came out, I named it Code Blue 99. Book number two is The Light, The Truth, and The Way. And I know you've kind of combined those two books into a new book, uh, one now called My Encounter with Jesus at Heaven's Gates. But back then with the two books, did you, did you know that much of what you were writing about? or Even after writing the two books, Trevor, I did not know what I experienced. I did not know what that meant, okay? Honestly, deep inside me, I still wanted to know what I witnessed, what all these things mean. Nothing in the Hindu scriptures relate to any of the stuff that I just mentioned to you. I was looking for answers. It would be five years before Sandy started getting some real answers to questions. Five years before he would walk into a Christian church here locally, Grace Church in Middleburg Heights in Ohio. And guess what the sermon was about that day? He was specifically, as if he was talking to me, was the narrow door. What the narrow door meant in Matthews. And what did he say it meant? He said that this is the only door that you can get in there. That door is only by coming to the Lord Jesus and surrendering to him, knowing him personally. 
So I came home and I started reading that chapter, what he was preaching on. And then that exactly what I witnessed there is a narrow door and where the Lord was guarding there. And that is the door that we can go through. There will be no other way, only one entry there. I've also heard that door, uh, that door is love. You can't get into heaven without there being love in you. Uh, and that's the love and compassion that he did on me. The only reason I'm telling this today, because of his grace, I did not earn it. I have every reason to fall into that, into the lake of fire. The only reason I'm speaking to you today, because, because of his love, because of his compassion, because of his grace. It is looking for one-on-one -on -one relationship with him. I'm with you. It, it is all about relationship. That is, that is key. Now, the church can certainly help us find that relationship and teach us and hopefully be our teachers and guides and all that. But, but you are absolutely it's, right. He wants a relationship. It's not about which church doors you walk through. I, I'm but that's, that's what I found in this church because by going to the church one by one, that all the questions I had, I got the answer. There you go. And that's what the church I should do. He did pull me into this great church, right? That I, I drove by that numerous times. I never went in. He pulled me in. So I totally believe you because when you walk in and you get the sermon you need to hear, that, that's a sign. If that isn't a touch by heaven moment, yeah. It's nothing by coincidence. It's all pre preordained. Right? It's already already decided by him. He knows who is who is people are. I just find it interesting the the symbolism of standing on the edge. You were on an edge. Hell or heaven. Which one do you want? Hell or heaven? Exactly. I cannot come back to this world where I was. No way. Once you live, that's it. And the trouble with living solely for ourselves as we're basically picking hell. We're not picking, we're not picking love. We're not picking a relationship with Jesus. Are we, yeah. we're picking a relationship with ourselves pretty much, you know, and that narrow entry door is open only through love because that's the first thing that he said, go back to your family, love your family and love your children. Because if we don't love our family, love our children, we cannot love God. You cannot love Jesus. Yeah, yeah. We this can say we man. love God, but if we don't love those around us, then then the, yep. uh, yeah, it's not there. You remind me a great deal in that part of it about Howard Storm, who you may have heard of, uh, with his near death experience, because he was an atheist, and uh, what Jesus said to him was, "Now go back and love the one who's in front of you, no matter who's in front of you." And uh, yeah, yeah. But what do you want me to do? And he, and Jesus said, "No, that's it. Just love the person that's in front of you." It's harder than you think. And sometimes that is your wife and that is your kids. And that is the, the neighbors, the friends, you know. But look at what's happening all over the world. That People don't love. Husband and wife, they don't love each other. Yeah. Children, they don't love their parents. Parents don't love their children. So the families are breaking apart. Everywhere, not only here, everywhere. It's scary, isn't it? Yes, it is. Even my family members, even my wife, she did not witness what I did. She was on this side. My children, they don't know him. I'm trying to tell, I cannot force anybody to come to him. This is going to be all come to him only whenever the Holy Spirit draws them near him. So they remain, remain Hindu? Yes, in their heart, they are still Hindus. Yeah. But, I'm, but I'm telling them whenever I get a chance, I tell them what actually happened, but sometimes they don't want to hear it. Do they think it was a dream? What do they think it was? Oh, you just it just happened. Medical medical miracles. No, it's nothing to do with medical. They didn't do anything for me. Yeah, nothing. one thing on the medical end is the medical end, but the experience with Jesus, how do they how do they put their head around somebody who doesn't know Jesus having that experience? That's the part they don't understand. They don't understand. They said this miracle happens, God saves you. But who is that God? I'm telling you who that God is. That God is Jesus. There's no other God in this world. Okay? There's no other God. He's the only one in human form. Okay? And all the gods that I knew in my religion, none of them I witnessed there. None of them saved me. But every 
think that whoever saved me, whoever gave me all these instructions is none other than Lord Jesus. Does your family like you more or less now? Uh, I, I would, uh, you know, I do not know. I cannot, you know, get inside their, inside their mind and heart. But I know the re- relationship between my wife and me, I think is getting better maybe more trustworthy, more trusting, more dependence. And I left it entirely up to the Lord. I am not going to forcefully tell somebody you need to come to, come to the, come to, you know, accept Lord. Otherwise you gone. No, that's not up to me. It's up to, up to my Lord. Right. My job is to love them as they are. What's sure. our what's our takeaway here today, Sandy? What's our takeaway? What uh, what are we going to walk away with from your story? It's only two things that I honestly believe right now, and I will say to anybody, is two things that he wants us to love him. Love your God. He is the only God. Love him. Love him and love one another, which is your family. If you can love your family and children, doesn't matter which religion, which culture, which skin color we have, we have the same thing that we need to go through. And this life doesn't end with our death. There is another life behind that and be prepared for that life. <laughs> well, how are we doing, Faith? Hi, can you hear me? We get to go with a woman from Australia named Faith. I was named Faith, but I had absolutely none. And yes, <laughs> yeah. I get you. I get you. There was no faith. She grew up Catholic, hated her Catholic faith. Prayer, a waste of time. Hell, demons, all that talk. Fear. That's just fear tactics is all that. That's just that's just there to make you behave is all that is. Her mom and grandmother, they they came from faith and stayed with faith. In fact, how she got her name was that her grandmother somehow one day just said three times in a row. Call her faith. My mom said, what? She said it three times. Call her faith. And everyone looked at her like, I guess her name is Faith. Uh, my mama to this day said it freaked her out. That's why she called me Faith. I don't even have a middle name, just Faith. But being told this as a child, I, did, I, I resented it, I guess you could say. My mum would always say, you know, you're special, God named you and things like that. And um, so I've never really talked about that, but that's how that's how I got my name. In this episode, in fact, I'm going to make this two episodes. There is so much here. There is so much here because we get to go with Faith Green to hell and to heaven. We get to experience all of it with Faith Green. Faith died back in 2014, more than once, first on the operating table. And before she went into surgery, her mom brought a priest in for a confession. I don't remember it, but mum said I did. Um, and obviously, if I didn't remember it, I didn't mean it. I never meant any of these. Going to church and doing confession, I never meant it. I never had real faith. Um, I did as a little girl, and then I lost it. But I never had real faith, not like I do now. Faith Green would tell you that 18 months prior to dying, she was living what she would call a normal life. This is before the spiral into drugs, addiction, meth being the latest drug of choice, a, an infection that worked along with the drugs that caused a weakening in her heart. Her aortic valve needed attention. She needed this operation. I'm surprised I'm here, but anyway, thank you, God. And Faith was now in the business of drugs. She was in the underworld. She was ruining lives. She was selling this stuff. Yes, I I was living a pretty rotten lifestyle. I was living with my partner. We were doing everything. We okay. were doing everything. Any crime that you could pretty much get away with to make money, the cars, the power, you know, and with that power, I was almost at one stage, I think, even addicted to that, having people afraid of me, afraid of who um, Matt and I were, afraid of who our friends were. Um, we were hanging out 
with some really, really dark, dangerous people. And we we got ourselves in, involved in something we were not in no way prepared for. You ever done any jail time? Never. I, I would have deserved to. Faith had long ago turned away from God. More recently, she had turned to a life of crime. And this was the moment that God decided to reveal himself to Faith through a series of of near-death experiences, beginning with her open-heart surgery in June of 2014. The first thing I remember was looking up and seeing the surgical lights. And I don't know how to describe it. It's some of the things that I've, uh, I try to put into words, but I just cannot describe, but it's almost like the roof opened up. And this most incredible, warm, loving, light just came down and it engulfed me and I remember just looking at this light thinking I just want to go there please I just want to go there and I was well I was in awe I was in absolute awe of what I was not just seeing but feeling I hadn't felt that kind of love in a sorry in a very very long time and that kind of safety and just unconditional love um Faith doesn't know it, but she's died. On the operating table, she died and then came back. Now she's in a two-week coma. She's going to die again. So she's all hooked up. She's got all these tubes, and she's gone. She's in a coma as far as everyone there at the hospital is concerned. She's in a coma. She's out of it. And yet, on a spirit level, she's seeing everything. She's seeing people come in. She's seeing the doctors. She's seeing the nurses. She wants to communicate with these people. She's trying to communicate with these people. And I was trying to get their attention, but I couldn't. I'm witnessing what's happening. I'm seeing my mum, nurses coming in, talking to each other. I'm trying to get their attention, but I don't understand why they're not responding to me. It wasn't until I saw there was these two nurses, one Filipino in appearance. Um, the other one was blonde. They are really pretty, like really pretty women. And they were talking in the corner. And I remember looking over and they're going through my paperwork and they're lifting up pages. And as they're lifting up the pages, I see an upside down crucifix. Now, that to me, I know that that's, that's, a, that's a bad sign, that's a negative, that's dark, that being Catholic, that scared me and I reacted and I said to them, what does that mean? What, why is that on my paperwork? And I remember... Then both of them just stopping and then looking at me, but they looked at me in the most insidious, hateful way, and then they began to laugh. Now, I remember being really surprised because I've been trying to talk to nurses the entire time or anybody, to even my mother, to try and get their attention, but nobody was hearing me. But they were, they could hear me, and they started to laugh. And then they, they started to talk to the each other about me saying this, I don't want to swear, but this um, bitch, she can hear us. She can hear us. And they were happy that I could hear them. And I said, what does that mean? I was trying to get answers. I wasn't, I didn't understand firstly why they were being so mean to me and calling me names. Secondly, I didn't understand why there was an upside down crucifix on my paperwork and um, why they're getting enjoyment out of my confusion. And they just said, well, 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 you screwed your life up, Faith, and the upside-down crucifix, that's your mark. You've been marked for hell. And they said, we're just waiting for you to die. And you're going to hell. You, mean, you, you screwed your life up on earth, and, yeah, this, this is... The whole concept this is, of this doesn't make any sense, does it? It's like finally somebody's talking to you, and they're talking to you like this. Yes. Because you, you don't know who they are yet. No, I think they're nurses. I think they're just two bad people trying to yeah. hurt me. Are they dressed like nurses? Dressed like, gowned up like nurses and interacting. Now, this is what freaks me out, interacting with other nurses. So I, st I've, I think I've got a little more understanding on that now. Um, and it was actually after speaking to Howard Storm. Faith referencing Howard Storm, one of the more celebrated near-death experiences because he too encountered demons and then Jesus. And it was then I, I said, use the demons. And they went, yes. And they laughed. They were laughing and mocking and calling me the most disgusting, vile 
names. They hated me. And they all they wanted to do was hurt me. They they couldn't wait. They were in glee and they wanted to assist. And they kept saying those words too. And they've always stayed with me, assisting my transition. They were assisting you in your transition. Transition. Interesting. And it creeps me out to this day. But they were also trying to get me to like curse God. They were victimizing me. And so th- this is what they do to us now. I think what I was getting to see, I think I was getting to see, honestly, what goes on behind the scenes that we can't see, that we're not privy to as humans. But that's that's how it is. Because my guardian angel I, was there. Now, I met him later in heaven. He was there. He was always in the background. They tell you telepathically. It's like a knowing. You, I knew that. He was always there. But I never, ever called out to God. If I had called out to God, he would have been there for me straight away. Yeah. I, I bought into the demons' lies. I bought into their manipulation. I, I felt I, I felt victimised. I didn't understand why they hated me so much. I didn't feel deserving of it. And um, I, I was, I just, I had blinders on. I was just so focused on them and trying to survive that I wasn't seeing all the beautiful miracles that were happening around me. Do you understand that I can see now looking back? Like even when my mother came in, um, every time she'd walk in the room, her aura. Now, when I was a little girl, I could see auras. And it went away when I was, I think I was about 12 years old. And her aura was just magnificent. And it repelled the demon nurses. They would leave. And and I got peace. It was the only time I got peace. And when my mum prayed, I not only... Um, I could see her prayer. I could see the power of her prayer. But I didn't still, it's happening right in front of me and I'm not acknowledging God's miracles. I wasn't seeing it. Right. We don't know the power of prayer, do we? No. We don't, oh. we don't see it like you were able to see it, how it repels them. Oh, they can't, they hate it. They hate it. They hate the rosary too. Yeah, the rosary. Um, the power of prayer, God showed me that. He showed me it was prayer that did that, and I'm so glad he did because I used to think it was a waste of time. I used to see it as a punishment as a child. I really did. I I resented the rosary. I resented anything to do with prayer, and I I thought it was a waste of time. I'd even say it to my mum, you know, you're just wasting your time. During this two-week coma, Faith's heart stopped on numerous occasions, at least five by by her mom's count, and on at least one occasion... Faith had another one of these, the roof opens up encounters? The roof just literally slid across and opened up and a light, just the most unbelievable, same unbelievable, warm, loving light just engulfed me and embraced me. But this time as I'm floating up towards the light, just dropped me. That's the only way I can describe it. It dropped me. And I'm falling so fast. Like I can't even describe how fast I'm falling. And I'm falling into what I knew it was a dark place because the first thing that I was the smell. It stunk. I was falling into this dark, disgustingly stenchy hole. And as I'm falling, I'm trying to stop. I, I, I know this is good. I, it's like a knowing. I know where I'm going is bad and I'm trying to stop myself and I'm grabbing at the walls and grabbing at whatever I can and it's like the walls of this hole just turned into every vile creature you can think of and they're ripping at my hands and ripping at my feet and I'm feeling it. I'm feeling every tear, bite, sting and as I'm falling, uh, by this stage I know I'm going to hell because I can hear the demons laughing and I'm falling into this dark hole and all I hear is these demons laughing telling me what they're going to do to me when I get there and I it was it's the terror the terror I was experiencing and all, all I could sorry this part's really powerful and it's really hard to explain But as I'm falling and I'm hearing these demons and I have this knowing and this is where I'm going forever, I knew it was for eternity, it was just a knowing, I could feel, 
I could feel, I think, God's essence, the light, the good part of me, the good faith was leaving me and I was just being left with the rotten evil that I'd allowed corrupt me. And I, I tried so hard to scream out to God and I just wanted to say, oh, I'm so sorry, and I just wanted to say sorry. God, I'm sorry. And as I'm trying to say those words, these it's like the evil in me was just taking my voice over and words were coming out. I don't even want to say, but it was like, I, I love you, Satan, and things like that. So as you're trying to cry out to God, they're not letting you say you're they're not letting you say the word God? They're not allowing me. They're manipulating my mouth and saying these vile things. And I had it was like this internal battle of faith against these demons and I'm just trying so hard to get the words out. And as I do again, and as this is happening all at once, simultaneously, I'm watching and feeling the light of God leaving me. And I, I just, in the end, I, I gave it everything. I mean, I never fought so hard in my life, and I just screamed out with every part of my being, I'm sorry, God, please forgive me, I'm sorry. Sorry. No, that's that's real. That's real faith. That's real. He did. He forgave you. And it was like in an instant, I'm back in the universe. In space, I'm just floating. And uh, God wanted me to see this because I needed <laughs> to see the power of prayer. I'm looking at the earth, but this time... The earth is vibrating this energy of energies. I, there's no way to describe it, but this vibration is coming off the earth. And it's like space stitches, but it's so much more beautiful. And you've got to imagine a pulsation vibration of this most beautiful, beautiful sound. And as this vibration is pouncing off the earth, it's, it's sort of like... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Um, shooting out light, energies of light. And as these energies of light are, are, are shooting up, to, I'm floating, they're pushing me a little bit up closer to heaven. So it was then I could hear what the sound was. I heard my mother's prayers. I heard my nana's prayers. I heard people I, I didn't know praying for me. I was hearing all the world's prayers. And these prayers were lifting me closer and closer and closer to heaven. And it got me there. It got me there. And I knew I, the whole journey, I knew, thank you, Mum. Thank you, Nan. Thank you, prayer meetings. Thank you, Facebook. I mean, the amount of people they had praying for me, and I had no idea. You can actually see the earth vibrating, pulsing, light flying out from it. You're you're also hearing it. It's making a, it's also making music. It was the prayer. It, it was it was prayer, but it sounded like music. But it was prayer. Oh wow! I, I, I can't describe it. It's indescribable. Again, we have no idea. We have no idea the power of we prayer. Don't. We just, we don't know. Oh, no. And that's, that's, if not, one of my biggest lessons I've learned from this, and it's something that I pray all the time. My children pray. Um, it is so powerful, and it's our biggest weapon against the devil. It's our biggest weapon, and people don't realize that. It drives them away. The amount of people they had praying for me and I had no idea. And um, as I'm getting into heaven, I was being welcomed. Uh, there was people I knew and there was people I, I didn't know but I knew. It was really bizarre. Um, it was like it was like a huge welcome, welcome home. Everything's alive, even the grass. 
it's living. The flowers are alive. They sing. They sing. <laughs> like uh, I can't even describe the music. It was, and I, I'm just getting a gaze, and I only got a glimpse, but what I got to see was just unbelievably beautiful. But like relationships up up there are different to down here. You're one big family up there. It's not like couples. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, there's no couples. There's no marriage. It's there. Yeah, there. Yeah. I tell you yeah. exactly. But I had to go through my life review. All right, so my life review. Angels. It's, there's this library, and an angel came down with the book of my life. Like, you know, it projects onto the sky. It's like a projector. And I'm looking at the sky, what's in my entire life from birth to death. God was just, I dropped to my knees when I when I heard his voice because that's how I remember it. I heard his voice and you hear it in the heart. It's straight to the heart. Um, it's like a connection he has with everyone, all of us individually. He knows us better than we know ourselves. And when he spoke, I knew. I was, I was in the presence of God and there was no hiding. You know, he sees it all. But um, it, it, he was just so bright and so light that I could not look at him. I, I didn't feel um, worthy. Um, I felt his unconditional love for me, his disappointment, almost like a father disappointed in a child. Um, it's forgiveness, um, absolute forgiveness, I mean. I knew instantly. I knew and I was sorry and it was like as soon as – I was sorry I was forgiven in that instant. It's like it didn't happen. So as you're going through your life review and you're seeing the bad stuff and you're seeing it and in that moment you're feeling sorry for that, what happens in the book? I'm so sorry. It's erased. It goes away. It's like it didn't exist, yes. Because you asked for forgiveness. And we can do that on earth. We don't, we don't have to wait till we get to heaven to do this. Well, that's, that's what God was showing me. It happens here on earth too. And we don't realize that. But you have to be sorry from your heart. And he knows our hearts. You can't just say you're sorry. You have to mean it. You have to feel it. Um, and I was. I was so, so I was sorry for everything. I was sorry for all of it. Did it feel like a long time you're looking at your life review? Do you have any sense of time? There's no time. There's no time. At all. doesn't exist up there. Mm-hmm. Like So I couldn't even tell you. It felt like I was up there for such a long time, but I, I just I can't even put it into words. I can't even. I try to work out the time, but there's just no time up there. Time doesn't matter. Well, you're outside time. Heaven is outside time. Absolutely. Well, exactly. Yeah. I was asked questions during my life review, and they were really simple questions. And I got to see so much. I I got to see where I screwed up. I screwed up so much. I got to see how stupid I was. I got to see all the gifts that God did give me that I didn't appreciate at the time. Um, I got to see how small acts of kindness, how they can change people's lives. I got to also see, because I had no self-love and no self-worth, that I I was a pretty nice person. Like at one stage, you know, what happened? Um, Because you're not only seeing but you're feeling. Every feeling of interaction that you have with people and what they're feeling. So you are empathetic and you have more understanding. After I got to the, um, my life review, sorry, I, I, I had, I guess you could say, um, the awakening. Um, I, I was allowed to stay. However, now God always knew I was never staying. But this is how. Good for you, girl. <laughs> Good for you. There you go. Now you're on to it. But he said, you know, you can stay, but... This is what's going to happen because of your choices, decisions you made on earth. If you die now, this is what's going to happen to your children. And it wasn't good. Like, it it, it was beyond. And I had to come back to fix up my screw-ups for a start, try and save my children. And also, I did meet someone in heaven, um, Matthew, my partner's sister, who died 10 years ago now. 
to um, a really rare brain cancer and she was the most beautiful woman in the world. Like if anyone got straight to heaven, it was Danielle. Um, I never met her, but she came to me. She showed me what was going to happen to Matt if I didn't come back and tell him that heaven's for real, you need to change your life because you're going to hell, mate. Um, and she showed me him in, oh, well, not she, God showed me him in hell. And um, it, it was horrific. And um, to see something like that for me, to not give up on him. And she pretty much said, if you don't give up on him, he's going to come good. He's going to be the most amazing husband to you. But more than that, he's coming here. He'll come here. If you give up on him, he's going down there. And um, I was so happy in heaven. I was, yes, of course, of course. I won't give up on him. I won't give up on him. And I got to have, I guess, God's just showing me um, what to look forward to because you don't want to leave. Like, you just don't. Well, of course not. So you're finding out that uh, your guy, Matt, He's going to end up in hell if you don't go back. What about your What about your sons? What would have happened? Well, um, I, my oldest son, he's 24 now, and he was 19 at the time. I was showing him OD'd on heroin um, in a toilet cubicle, and I, which um, ironically ended up coming true some years later, but he's okay, but he had OD'd. And my younger one, he's 22 now, I saw him. He was hanging from a tree and he'd killed himself. And I was shown that he'd become an alcoholic and just gave up. And um, because of my choices, it was all my choices that my kids were going to be left without a mother on their own. And mind you, it was tough on them too because they had a really good mum up until the 18 months prior to me getting sick. I really, you know, I was I was a very good mother and my kids went to good schools and um, I, I was devoted to them completely. So it was really tough on them. But, yeah, I came back and um, had to, but God was just, he, he gave me a little feast, I guess you could say. It was like a little celebration, but it's not little. And there it was food and, and wine and singing and dancing. And that's the last thing I remember. It's very social. It's very, very, very social. Uh, yeah, it's not like you're just going up there just to party. It's nothing like that. <laughs> no, not at all. Not at all. But I also got to see things, a pet, a dog that I'd had, all my pets were up there. I was really surprised about that because my mum always said that um, animals don't have souls, they don't go to heaven. And I believed that, but that's not true. Everything you love is in heaven. All of God's creations is in heaven. All the animals are in heaven. Like it's, it's like on earth, but so much better. But it's nice to know that my pets are. Yeah. My pets are up there. All our, everything that we love yeah, so I, I'm extremely still, um, even though I've experienced so much, I'm still learning, processing it and trying to to make as much sense of it as I can. But um, I, got, I got the basics and it's that there is God. He loves us dearly. Um, we are living in the last days and we are special for that. When you say last days, did you get any special understanding of what that means? I don't. I think last days, I think the world's going to get to a point where it is, um, they've turned their back on God and Christianity and I think we're living in worse times than the days of Noah, to be quite honest, right now. Of what, Noah? Then Noah, yeah. yeah I think yeah. that, you know, but what I do have faith, what gives me hope is that um, – there are a lot of good people in this world that do believe in God. I'm, I'm finding that out every day that uh, are praying and prayers are powerful. And pray, 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 pray. Prayer is our biggest weapon that we've got. This entire experience is so out of left field. How, how, how do you want to sum it up? What do you What do you want to do to kind of close this out, Faith? Okay. Um, all right. That God loves us all. Um, that the challenges that we have on this earth that are given to us are usually we we get what we can handle our challenges and they had to help us grow um being a victim victim mentality does not work that comes from the devil 
um, 100%. Um, prayer is so powerful. It is more powerful than it got me uh, literally out of the clutches of Satan's hands. He almost had me. I was right there. I was fallen. And um, God's mercy, God heard me. And I yelled out to him and he gave me a second chance. And he's not only just given me a second chance, but everything I was shown has come true so far. Yeah, it took it. I went through another two years of hell getting Matt out of that lifestyle. Like he had to go to jail for a little bit which didn't hurt him, you know, some time to reflect is always good for the soul. But our life's amazing. Um, he, I've never had anyone love me like he loves me. He's a Christian. He's a believer. He tells everybody about my near-death experience. But um, all the glory goes to God in every way. I've never been so happy. Um, I don't have a lot. We live in a little two-bedroom apartment right near the water. My life is so blessed. I have my both my boys here and um, there's nothing but joy and laughter and happiness in our lives and that's because God's in our lives. Even though he sends us all the signs in the world, we, we've still got that little bit of Woody Allen in us. So I'd like to ask, uh, how's your relationship with death now? My relationship with death remains the same. Uh, I'm um, strongly against it. And, um, <laughs> you know. <laughs> What's that saying? Uh, everyone wants to get to heaven, but nobody wants to die to get there. We don't trust God. Face it, there's a part of you, there's a part of me, doesn't quite trust God all the way with his timing, who he takes, when he takes, the timing of it all, uh, whether it's taking us or a loved one. We, uh, we, we've, it's like, are you sure you know what you're doing? And yet we have all these signs. God, in his mercy, keeps saying, do you, did, did you hear, see this story? How about this? Did you read that book? Did you see? I was just rereading one of the books about this by a doctor. She's a surgeon, a spine surgeon, Dr. Mary Neal. She was, uh, maybe, you, maybe you read the book, uh, it's called To Heaven and Back, which I've named this episode because that's what this is. It's to heaven and back and to trust God in the big picture that he has perfect timing. Dr. Mary Neal, surgeon, spine surgeon. She is kayaking down in Chile, okay, remote. She's out, out in the middle of nowhere, out in the middle of a jungle, and she's uh, kayaking, and she's kind of forced into part of a river. She doesn't want to go, and she goes off this huge waterfall. Her kayak becomes pinned in the rocks below. She is stuck underneath there, and she will be there for almost 15 minutes. It takes a while for the people around her to even know that she's missing, and then they're like, where's Mary? And then they start looking and looking and looking, and then they see her red helmet. And unfortunately, she is right where the water is the most tumultuous. They can't get to her. She is, she's down there and they can't get to her. There's no way. The water is just ferocious right there. They can't. They try everything. Minutes go by and they, there's nothing they can do. And then God starts working. Uh, one of the people that was trying to save her, a friend, said that's when the supernatural began. Suddenly there was a rock where there was no rock so they could at least get to the boat. They could stand on this rock. It wasn't there before. In fact, after this event, when they came back to that same spot and looked, that rock was gone again. It, was miss it wasn't there for minutes. And then suddenly, oh, you guys need some help? Okay. Suddenly there was a rock. And so finally, rescuers could stand on that rock, which gave them some access to the kayak. I'm going to speed up the story considerably here before they finally were able to get Mary out of the water and over to shore. And she's bloated and purple, and she's not there. They start CPR. And somebody says, why, why, why are you going to do that? If she comes back, she's going to be brain dead. She's been down there almost 15 minutes. But they start the CPR. And every now and then, Mary takes a breath. And it's like, oh, she's coming back. No. And they're yelling at her, come on, Mary, come on back. Come back, come back, come back. And, and Mary, every now and then, take a breath. And come on, Mary, come back, come back. Right? Now then, on Mary's end... She's down below the water. She's always had an immense fear of drowning. That's just, yeah, don't we all? <laughs> I mean, come on. The fear of drowning. And she's down below and she's pinned, but she says, she goes right to God. And she says, okay, God, you've got me out of things before. You want to get me out of this? Okay, if you don't, God's will be done. At some point, she is no longer in the water. She is coming up out of the water, 
her spirit has separated from her body. She's moved on now. And she is welcomed by this welcoming committee. There are these people, like on the shore, uh, glistening, gleaming. Uh, it was nonverbal communication, just mind to mind. I've never felt such love, and she's never been happier in her life than she was right there in that moment. This was incredible, and she loved this moment, and then suddenly she was being back in her body, taking a breath, and was like, what is this? Then, boom, back to the welcoming committee. And she went back and forth, back and forth. She was feeling this, I'm out of here, this is where I want to be, and then, boom, back into the body again, taking a breath, and she was irritated by it. And she heard the people yelling, come on, Mary, breathe, breathe, and she's thinking, I don't want to breathe, and back to the welcoming committee. And the welcoming committee then takes her towards this hallway where the light was, where God was, and then she had this feeling, and those around her, these glistening, gleaming spirits, she felt their, she, I think she would use the word oppressive. It was oppressive because they said, oh, you have to go back. You have to go back. You, you're not done yet, and you'll get more messages along the way what you're, what you're to do next, but you have to go back. And she was not a happy camper. Back into her body, she began breathing, came to, sort of, in and out of consciousness. They strap her to a kayak to take her out of there. They're in the middle of nowhere, nowhere. They don't even know where they're going, but they strap her to a kayak and start heading a steep uphill through a bamboo forest where suddenly, out of nowhere, these tribesmen appear. They don't say a word. It's just kind of like, follow us. They don't say a word. They just follow. She said later, were they angels? What were they? But they led them to a path, and then they disappeared. They were gone. Where's this path go? They're in the middle of nowhere. There are no cars around. There's nowhere, there's nowhere to go, but that path leads them to some sort of road, and parked there on the side of the road is an ambulance. What? An ambulance. Why is it there? No rhyme. No reason. There's an ambulance parked there. They put her in. They take her to the hospital. And it, it continues the next part of the story. To Heaven and Back by Dr. Mary Neal. It's amazing. And there's thousands of these stories out there to constantly reinforce that, that we're supposed to look at it in the big picture, that when he takes us, it's the perfect time. By the way, because Mary Neal's life was saved that day, two people did not die when they were going to die. With that in mind, um, I was talking to Margie Newman, and she talked about her mom and her near-death experience. When my mother was about to give birth, she was in her 30s, she was about to give birth to my sister Sarah, who is, she's 11 months older than I am. She went into the hospital because she had pneumonia, severe case of pneumonia. And during that, her stay in the hospital, she gave birth to my sister, Sarah Ann, but she was very, very ill. They didn't think she was going to make it, and they started to treat her with heavy doses of penicillin. And as it turned out, my mother had a severe allergic reaction to it. So, um, for instance, she lost all the enamel on her teeth, so it was just they were just all black. My mother says that she was aware that she was dying and she was aware of someone in her room who was waiting to take her, but she kept fighting it because she had six little girls at home and she just got to have an infant. One day she said it occurred to her that if she is to be taken home, then God has another plan for her children. And so she decided to just let go and let God do it. She says the next thing she knows, um, and she's not aware of time lapses, but the next thing she was aware of was being surrounded in um, a beautiful place. She said it was filled with colors. She said you could feel warmth and love surrounding you everywhere. She said she didn't see this with her eyes as we see, but it was perceived through her, through her body. While she was enjoying basking in this love and beautifulness, she heard a voice, and it said to her with a surprise, oh, it's our Mildred. And then another voice said, but we were expecting Blanche. And so then the first voice said, Mildred, you'll have to go back. We're not expecting you yet. And the next thing I know, my mother says she knew was she was on a table covered in paper. And she doesn't remember what she did or if she said anything to let whoever know that she was alive because, you know, covered in paper, she was in the morgue. But she said the next thing she knew, she was being rushed through the hallways and put back into a room. 
her doctor, um, his name was Dr. Rosie, was our family doctor. He came rushing in. He said, Mildred, what are you doing? And she said, I died. And he said, I know you did. I pronounced you. And then sure enough, her sister came in and said the same thing. And she said, Dorothy, I died. And she said, honey, I know they've notified me. That's why I was coming. Wow, that's a wow! And what? Are, and who's Blanche? <laughs> so, oh, that's the, 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 the ironic piece of the story. Blanche was my mother's cousin, who did pass two weeks later. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So, did so, did, did your mom let Blanche? Did she say anything to Blanche, or just let it be? No, no, no she didn't. Okay. You know, you hear about these stories where someone's sent off to the morgue and then they come back, but. Uh, yeah, so you imagine how much time had to have lapsed, you know, between being pronounced and then taken, because they don't take them right down. They, you know, get them situated first, and then someone has to come up there and get them on a gurney when when they can, you know. And they have to be so, sure. They have to be yeah. sure. That has to be astounding for everybody concerned. I don't want to be the person in the morgue when someone comes back. That's not where I want to be, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I mean, you're basically naked on a slab covered in paper, right? Yep, that's how she was. That's how she became aware of being back in her body, being being there on the slab. Yeah, and you're looking over at some guy <laughs> naked on a slab covered in paper going, that's exactly. not, that's not a, normal. <laughs> right, this is, this is odd. <laughs> yeah. Hi, sir. Are you awake too? No. Hmm. hmm. This actually helped me in my own life because I don't know why, but as a, a young child, I was extremely fearful of death and I would um, cry out in anger to God because why in the world did you put me in this place that I'm going to know and be used to and tell me you're taking me somewhere else I don't know that place I don't remember it you know what I mean mm -hmm. and, and I would I would be very upset about it and so I guess when I was probably about 10 it was in the middle of the night and I woke up frightened scared that this was going to one day happen to me. I don't even know how the word death came into my life, you know, but, but it totally, totally freaked me out. And so it was that evening that my mother told me about her experience and then talking to other family members, they had, they had all known about it. So, and that helped you deal with death. It helped me very much because I realized that this wasn't some, um, I guess, mean thing that God was trying to do to me. This was a, a benevolent thing where he was taking me to where I had been and he's taking me back home again. And it's, and that's what it is home. So then, yeah, for the rest of my life, I did read lots of books about near death experiences and other people's experiences with God to learn more about it. When my mother passed the night she did pass, and my sister, Nancy was in the room and she said, Mom, all of a sudden, just lifted her arm and she said, my daddy's here. And then she was gone. These are common but uncommon, similar but not similar uh, situations. And until that book was written in the 70s called Life After Life, nobody knew that people were having these similar I kinds read of circumstances. That, yeah. It's a fascinating book. And he's written more since then. He's, and he's still alive. That Moody is his name. It is amazing. It is very profound. And I think it, it tells a lot to us as children of God that, you know, there most definitely is something else after this life. Thanks, Margie. And again, did God make a mistake? Oh, we're supposed to wait for Blanche. Of course not. Took the right person at the right time to reinforce my faith, your faith, uh, Margie's faith, as it turns out, right? This fear of death that she had took that away with that experience. Untouched by Heaven, Everyday Encounters with God. First, three things. Number one, subscribe to the podcast, please, in whatever app you're in. Just hit subscribe. It tells the podcast gods, small g. It enables more people to uh, be introduced to the podcast. Number two, thank you so much for your support, financial support on a monthly basis through Patreon. You can go to patreon.com directly and look for Trapper Jack. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Or just go to this episode here at, uh, at touchbyheaven.net and uh, become a patron that way. And number three, Trapper Jack Speaks. If you'd like me to come and give a talk about these kinds of things, how God shows himself right here and right now, this is what I love to do. So I'd love to uh, talk to you. So go to TrapperJackSpeaks.com 
and take a look at my video. And, uh, and if, uh, if I'm a right fit for you, let's get in touch and talk about it. All right. Trapper, I'm good, man. Good morning. Now, what do we need to know about Jose? Grew up uh, in L.A., still lives in L.A. Mom, very faithful, good, faithful Catholic. Dad, not so much, not so much into his faith. My dad, my dad was, wasn't all that strong in the faith. He would, sometimes he would like argue, he was like, oh, we don't have to go to church. I got to watch the, the football game and stuff. So <laughs> right. that always put an impact in my, in my head. Like, you know, dad is, he's more concerned with, with watching sports and going to mass. We would eventually go, but it was after like, you know, some, some arguing and stuff because my mom did not drive. So I remember going to first communion, and then I just stopped going to confession. I was just uh, living in, living the things of this world, money, power, and fame, and just work was very important to me. Uh, working long hours, my son didn't even know me, because um, I just would spend so much time outside the home. So 2012 for New Year's, for New Year's, my my uncle, my youngest uncle, my 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 dad's brother, he was there, and and I knew he was he was into like um, medicinal marijuana for his for his knee he had knee problems he would either smoke it or 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 eat or eat cookies and stuff that he would homemade he would make them homemade so i was there and then all my aunts and cousins are like hey uncle did you did you bring us our like a dozen of cookies of of medicinal marijuana cookies and and he asked me hey, would you like one i said no i've never i've never done drugs in my life and he gave me he gave me two cookies and i brought it home and i told my wife about it and she was like well, maybe we'll take it, you know, maybe we'll take it one day. And so I brought it home and I put it away in the cabinet and stuff. And like two weeks later, go two weeks come by and my, my wife is uh, with, with her dad spending the night and I'm home, I'm home by myself and stuff. And this, this urgency to just eat this cookie came. So I went to the cabinet, grabbed the cookie, half the cookie, ate the cookie. And I didn't, I didn't feel anything. It was, I was just fine. I was, and my uncle said, if you don't feel anything in 30 minutes, just eat the other half. So I ate the other half of cookie and. And within 20 minutes, I started feeling like anxious. My heart, my heartbeat started going up and I just wasn't feeling well. And then I, I went to go drink some water. I went to take a shower and just to get this thing out of me. And, uh, and then it was just, I was just getting a lot worse, feeling, feeling sick. And then, um, so I call, I call my brother cause he, he lives like two blocks away. I said, you know, I don't feel good. I ate this cookie. And he's like, what did you do? He was all upset. I mean, I was like, man, whatever you did, it just helped me out. I don't feel good. I feel like I'm just going to pass out. He's like, oh, I'm going to head right over there right now. Call 911, go outside and call 911. I step outside my, in my, um, outside my house. And then my head is, is hurting so hard. Just to have a, this headache and my heart just beating so fast. I could, I could feel pain in my chest. And my brother shows up and then they put me in the uh, gurney, put me in the, in the ambulance and they start driving me away. And then they, uh, they give me oxygen because it was just, I was just breathing so hard. Give me oxygen. I'm, I'm on, on the way to the uh, ambulance. I mean, on to, to the hospital, but I just felt like I was taken away from my body. My soul just was taken up, taken up. And I, and I saw myself being driven away in the ambulance. And then I just, I go into a different state, like at a different place. And I, and I start, I start, um, watching a video of my life, my kids being born and, you know, spending time with my family. And so you're getting kind of a life review without having normally, you know, we hear about angels or Jesus or somebody's there, but you, you were given your life review by yourself basically. Right. Just watching a, a, it was just a review of my adult life, the, the bad times too, all the times I committed sins in my life. I got to see those two and all I wanted to do was just to come back and ask for forgiveness to, to those that I, uh, that I hurt in your mind. Are you seeing it projected in front of you? Well, how are you seeing it? Being, seeing, being, seeing it, seeing it, seeing it projected in front of me. You know, that just brought me a lot of, a lot of sadness, a lot of grief. I was just, my soul was just suffering so much that all I wanted to was just to come back. And then there was, there was other people there that I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know who they were. But they were also kind of like, like talking to me, but it wasn't like communicating like we are over the phone. It was just like, like instant knowledge of everything. When you, when you were watching this and you were talking about seeing your sins, are you seeing yourself hurting others? What are you, what are you seeing? I could, I could give you an example. Like there was, there was, there was, uh, there was like a question that was given to me and the, and the guy said, well, are, are you, um, are you, are you, are you Catholic? And I said, yeah, I'm Catholic. And then I saw the video of my life of the times that I rejected the faith, I wouldn't go to church. 
and I would argue with my mom about the faith. And then, and then, and then there was, there was no like, see, you're, you're not, or you're, you know, you made a mistake here. You, you were denying the faith or you were arguing with your mom. It was just like instant knowledge that I was not living my faith. And then, so all I wanted to do was just come back. And I said, well, send me back. I want to fix it. I want to do better. And then the guy's like, well, it's not up to me. You need to keep going. There was so much suffering that was going on. I just wanted to give up on this, this, the sins that I offended God. And all I wanted to was just to, just to, just to ask for forgiveness. But the, the people that were with me, there's like, it's not up to me. I can't, I can't, for, you need to keep going. Like I was walking this path and it was a mountain that was, I was walking up a mountain, a path up, a, up a mountain at the top of the mountain was a light. And, um, and, and I knew that was the end. Like if I were to get to that light, there was no way I could come back. So all I wanted to was just to avoid the light and come back to, to, to the world so I could fix my life. And then, and then as I, as I, as, as I was getting younger and, and watching my video, I was getting closer to the light. So my, 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 the book, the, the video of my life was, was backwards, you know, from the time as adult to, to, to the time I was born. It was taking you back to, almost to your home. I mean, it, I mean, we're all, we're all from heaven. So it's like, right. it, was, it was, you were seeing it in reverse and you were getting closer to the light, the closer you got to your birth. Right. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So there was a one time, there was a one time where I just, I just gave up. I said, I, I can't do this anymore. I, I can't. It was just causing so much pain in my, mm. in, into my soul. I was just, I was just, I mean, I could just be like crying of, 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 of just the, the pain that I was going through. And then, and then my grandma that passed away when I was eight years old and my sister that I had never met, they, they, they appeared to me and, and they were, and they were just so, they brought me so much peace and comfort. And my, my sister was, she passed away when she was five months old. So I saw her maybe when, when she, maybe as a, as a little girl, maybe eight years old. And, and I saw my mom, my, my grandma elderly, and she was holding my sister's hand and my sister that I never met and stuff. And they, and they, and they just, they, they brought me peace and they said, it's okay. You're going to be okay. Just keep going. Everything's going to be fine. And so they, so they brought me comfort. And I, and I just, I, I got the strength to just keep going. I, I needed to just keep walking this path and, and go through all this, the, 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 the suffering and joy that I had committed here on this earth. And then um, the video of my, my whole life. And then as a child growing up and stuff, and then being with my mom, caring, caring for me as a child. And I, I saw myself like just being born too. And then I just had so much love for my mom. And all I wanted to was just to come back and, 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 and I just, and I would, and I would, I would scream. I said, I can't die. My mom is going to suffer so much. She already lost a child. I can't die. My mom's going to die too. I got to see things of like how God created everything, created the earth, created the universe. And I just said, oh my goodness, God, you're, you're just, it's just wonderful how you created everything. There's a, there's a purpose for everything. Explain what you saw. Well, the, the universe, the people before me, how they how they influenced the, the world in a positive way I, I don't know i don't know who they were though but it was i mean it, it could have been the apostles or saints and stuff to do, doing doing the will of god on the, on this earth and all i wanted to do was be like them i said i want to i want to be like you guys i want to be i want to be like that but it was just too late i was already i was already dead I, I, there was no second chance for me did you say that you saw like the creation of everything like kind of how god put it into play or however it is he wanted to show you yeah, 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 pretty much. Yeah, I saw, I saw creation. I had, I had never read the Bible either. I was, I was, you know, I went through, I went through catechism. I, I, I knew of the Bible. My mom would say, you need to read the Bible, son. And I would read the Bible. I would read stories in the Bible. I said, mom, I don't understand this. This is just too complicated for me. And, and then she's like, well, you need to ask the Holy Spirit to guide you. You know, I was like, mom, well, I don't know. And then, but, but God was revealing how he created everything. So I was really, really, really close to the light. I was embraced. And the light and the light was love and it was just it was amazing it was it was i was like my brain was just i couldn't think about this world anymore my kids my family my job nothing because i was i was in this in this light of love and 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 then i and then i and then i saw i i, I didn't see that i didn't see um i didn't see a face but i saw the arms and the, and and, the, and he just he held me like a baby it was God the Father that held me like a baby because I just I screamed I I just I said God I just said God 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 and I 
And I said, well, you're, you're my father. I just felt this, this love, this peaceful love. It was just, it was just so beautiful. And then uh, he just, he held me like a baby. Like he said, nothing of this world mattered anymore. I didn't want to go back. I was just so at peace there. And then, and then he said to me, um, he said, you're my son. And then I said to him, well, you're my, you're my father. And it was just, the, the love was just amazing. And then he said to me, it's, it's time for you to go back. I said, well, I don't go <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I just get like this because it, it's just, it was so real. And then he said to me, it's time for you to go back. And I said, I don't want to go back. I'm happy here. This is, this is, I, I've been living all my life to be with you. Don't send me back. I'm happy here. And he said to me, he says, I need you. <laughs> and your kids need you. And then uh, right at that time, I was, I was taken back. I got to see, I got to see a video of my life again. But this time was, was from the child, the time I was, I was born forwards all the way to the, to pre that present time in 2013. And then, um, and then I just woke up in a hospital with, with, uh, with an IV fluid and um, uh, uh, oxygen and my, my brother, and my brother was right there with me. And um, the whole time. Did they tell you that you had died? No, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, they didn't, they didn't tell me I had died. And I asked my brother afterwards and I said, well, they didn't say that you, that you were dead, but you were in really bad shape. That, that second video where you're kind of going from now young to older, what was, what was the, what was the difference in what you were seeing? It was more joy. It was more joy because I was, I, I knew I was going to come back. And I was, as I was seeing my life, it was a good times in my life. It was a good times in my life. I didn't get to see the sins anymore. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't feel suffering. It was more a joy, the joyful experiences. And then, you know, but the big, the big, I mean, the things like growing up and being, getting married and seeing my, being with my kids, because that's all I wanted was just to come back to my kids. And, um, you get a sense that uh, I mean, I'm, as I'm reading, I'm trying to read this too. Is that it's it's almost like your sins had been forgiven, blotted out, and now here's the good stuff. It's kind of the, what I'm kind of sensing here, as you're being held by the Father. Tell me again, what what's what's going through you as you feel that love? Words words cannot describe, because because the the love was so great. Um, you know, there's a. Um, Mother Angelica, the founder of uh, EWTN, she once said, "If if I were to put the love of the of of everyone in the world into one, she said it would just be a speck in comparison to what the love of what God loves me." So that's that's how I see it. It's like if I were to put the love, if everyone in the world would just would love me, it would be just a just a speck in comparison to the, what the love of God has. What the love of, you know, God has for me. It was just so great. Words cannot describe. All I want to do is do his will so I could be back with him. So just, that's it. That's the purpose of our lives is to be, is to be with God. God made us for, for, to do his will on this earth, um, to fight, to fight the evil here. It's a evil, it's a battle. It's a battle with the evil. So, um, yeah, so I woke up and then my brother, my brother brought me home and stuff. And I was just like, something happened. I told my brother, something happened. Something weird just happened to me. I can't, ex I can't explain it. And he says, yeah, you know, just go home and rest and stuff. You're, you're going to be fine. I mean, thank God you're okay. And um, I had told my brother, don't tell my mom. I said, don't tell my mom. So the days, the days went by and I just, I just, I bought, I bought a Bible um, that, that week. You know, I went, I went to church. So that Sunday, and I haven't missed mass since. I go to mass every weekend. I, I uh, the scriptures when I read the scriptures they come to life. I like I'm I'm like I'm there. Every scripture that I read and stuff it's just easy. The parables I understand them. I just I just started praying. I said God, what is it that you want me to do? All I want to do is your will. Maybe maybe like a couple of weeks later he he revealed to me um, that he wanted me to of course to learn my faith and to and to and to share my faith to to de to defend the faith, you know, to bring souls back to Christ. And I, and I would just, I would listen to like EWT and radio and I took some uh, spiritual, uh, the spiritual exercises of saying the nations of Loyola. And then I said, God, well, this is, I, I love this. This is beautiful. This is what I've always wanted to do. This is what I'm, what you made me for. And then, um, 
And then he also put in my heart some certain topics like on abortion. Because I was I was back in those days, I was okay with abortion. I was just normal. It was legal. And then so he put it in my heart, like, you know, abortion is wrong at any at any time. I'm going to give you a quick, quick story because this is like the Holy Spirit just kind of just guiding me into into doing things and through a lot of through prayer. Um, I needed to do a job uh, about 20 minutes, 20 minutes away from from my home, 30 minutes away from my home. And then I and I show up and I do the job. And after I finished the job, it was it was put in my heart that I needed to go to the bank and I needed to pick up three hundred dollars. I said, well, why do I need three hundred dollars for? And then it was just like the Holy Spirit just like took me there. I just I looked up the bank and went to the Chase Bank. And then um, as I was driving by, I um, I saw some women outside of a, of a of a building with like small pictures of aborted babies. And I said, is that is that what I think it is? And I and I and I had been praying for this. I said, God, you you guide me to wherever you want me to go if it's if to 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 defend the unborn. And I and I parked at the at the location and I got out and I and I asked the women. I said, um. I said, I said, um, tell me about what you're doing out here. And they said, well, we're, we're trying to here to defend babies from being murdered through abortion. And I said, well, what, what can I do right now for you? I said, well, if you can make a donation to us, that would be great. I said, how much money do you need? What, 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 what do you need to buy? And she says, well, we need to buy bigger, bigger photographs so people could see better when they're driving by. I said, well, how much money do you need? She said, $300. And I pulled that money right out of my pocket. Said, God wanted me to give you this. It was just like, man, wow. I started, I was just like, wow, God works in such great, mysterious ways. Who, whose thought, eyes were bigger, I'm, yours or hers? <laughs> yeah. And then, and then she said she had been praying too. She says, I had been praying to God to send me a, to send me a warrior to help us. Um, you know, just, it's just doing the will of God. They understand that we, we have to do the will of God here. We have to be faithful to the, to the, to, uh, to God and 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 live the and live the sacrament so that we could one day be with be with God. Talk about your dad because when a father is all in, the whole family goes. The whole family comes with him. I told I told my dad I told my dad because my dad my dad would work with me. We we would go on jobs. I'm a I'm a I'm a service uh, uh, I'm a service guy. I work on um, you know service, so I travel a lot. And uh, every time I would go, I mean, I would just we were always listening to EWT on the radio. And then I, and then, and then he was said to you one day, he was just says like, what, like what, what happened to you that, you know, you had this great change in your, in, in yourself. And I, and I told my dad my story and then, um, and then it just, uh, it just, it changed him. He just says, well, you know, he says, it's going to take some time for me because this is, this is not, I mean, and it did take some time. It, it took a few, it took a few, maybe a few, a few months or maybe a year and stuff. But he uh, slowly, I guess, I guess it's like the thing is like with me, it was a 180 degree turn. It was from one day to the next. And then, and then I, and I wanted everyone to have that. I said, I want everyone to change right away. Like I was just like, like I wanted to force people like you guys need to like change your ways and go to church and understand the, the, the Bible and live the sacraments and, you know, stay away, get away from living the sin. And, and my mom, one time she told me, it's like, son, well, this is not how it is. People take small steps in the faith, you know, take small steps in their lives. And then um, <laughs> she's, you, she's not trying to br drag you down off the ceiling. <laughs> yeah. She's like, son, you need to, you need to just let, let the Holy spirit, you know, change their way. You're, you're there. God is using you to, to, to share your story. And then after that, God is going to handle the rest. And I just said, mom, yeah, yeah, that's great. <laughs> the fruit. What's the before and after. And on Jose, you know, how did Jesus, measure the love of the apostles. Because he said, I know you love me. I know you. How did he know? Well, they bought him a lovely pair of new sandals at Kohl's. It's just, it's just it's they, the color. No, they kept his commandments. That's what he said. You know, I can tell you love me because, because you keep my commandments. With Jose, it goes from, yeah, yeah, whatever, keeping the commandments to, oh, keeping the commandments. So that's how I do it now. I said, God, you, you put people in my life to, to, to share my story, and you handle the rest. Uh, but to see your life change the way it has, it's a little stunning, isn't it? When you look back going, I was this, and now I'm that. Pretty cool. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's friends of mine that I grew up with, and they're like, you know, they, they, they're still living in their, their, their life and stuff. And they're like, Jose, this is too much for me. I don't understand how you change so much from you, what you are now. Even, even customers of mine that I've known for, for so many years that I've, 
talk to them about my experience and they've, they've grown in their faith too. It's like, Jose, this is just crazy what you went through, but thank you for sharing with me. And I, you know, you've changed me too. You know, yeah. So, you know, talking to people about God, that's all I want to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, because before it was before it was like my my mom and dad's like me, me son don't talk about politics and don't talk about religion. I was like that's all I want to talk about mom is, is religion. <laughs> that's all I want to talk about. Everything else is boring. What else is what what what's it all about? There's there's nothing. There's no sense to it. Let's talk about God. <laughs> He's real. And of a near death experience. Here now is former English teacher Emily Rodovich, who is in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, where I met my wife and married my wife and where I got the name Trapper Jack. And I remember now I know where I've heard that name before. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. You have a great radio voice. Well, it's a rental because I have to turn it in at night. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my. Um, First of all, um, I was not brought up in a church, and the reason was because my father's family was Russian Orthodox, my mother's family was Roman Catholic, and the two shall never meet. However, my mother had a very deep faith. All right, let's uh, move forward here to when Emily was 16 years old. I, I went to a Methodist church, and uh, I got to know the minister very well, and I riddled him with questions and he looked at me and he said Emily until you have had a personal experience with God you don't really believe in God you only believe in the idea of God and I knew that that resonated with me so when I was 18 right after that I had the best personal experience with God that anyone could have, I had a near-death experience. Now, up until that time, I was petrified of death. So I had this near-death experience. I had, um, I would go and get allergy shots. And uh, I forget what the name of it is, anaphylaxis or something like that. Um, I came home you know, I, I stayed in the office. They said I was fine. I came home and my body started to swell up. And I was so swollen that my skin split. My, I was in bed, my skin on my arms and my legs and it split open. Uh, I could hard, I was having trouble breathing and everything. My tongue was swollen. And the doctor came, and there there just wasn't anything that could be done. He couldn't give me an injection. They couldn't move me. He said, all we can do is pray. And I would be in and out of consciousness. And the next thing I knew, you know, I was going through dark space, but I was on a train. I was only 18. Through this experience, uh, there was a beautiful conductor on this train. I said, where is this train going? And I said, are these people dead? And he said, um, it's, you know, it's stopping soon. Uh, I'll come back and get you. So it, the train went to a stop and I watched as all these, these people in dark suits and women were dressed. They walked up to the open doors of the train and this loving conductor came back and he loved me. I felt so safe with him and so protected. As I saw these people get off the train, Jack, they stepped off and they became, they merged with this light. They just disappeared and merged into this magnificent, and nobody can describe the light. It's, it's, it's not just light, it's energy, it's music, it's light, it's everything. And they became a part of this. And I, I wanted to fall. I wanted to go next. And he stopped me. And he said, you may look, Emily, but you may not leave. You may not enter. And I, you know, and I couldn't understand why. But I could see little buildings in the distance. And this whole imagery, Jack, communicated to me that we become one 
with the spirit of the Almighty, of, of God, that God is the life energy. He's everything in everything and everywhere. Yet each of us is an individual part of that oneness. And people apparently keep their identities in some way because I could see buildings which said to me, we become a part of a community which is separate and also a part of the one, if that makes any sense to you. It does. That's exactly what St. Paul said. It's exactly what he said. We're all different. We're all pieces and parts of one, of one. And obviously sharing the mind of God, when you step into him there, you're, you're going to always be sharing the mind of God. That's what heaven is, that perfection of sharing. Incredible love. Oh, that yeah. It's just powerful. That's, that's what he is. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Um, when I came to... Um, I was so filled with joy that uh, here is what here is what is so significant about a near death experience. It is the change that takes place in your being in everything. A, I knew that I was going to get better. That this. What I was going through was temporary. It had a reason. It had a purpose. My fear of death was gone. The love in my heart was multiplied. My joy was multiplied. And my heart was bursting with joy. <laughs> so, anyway. It's like God wanted to make sure we knew through all these thousands of experiences that it doesn't end in the grave. It just, you know, that there's more that everything that we hear about and read about in scripture and such is that it's true that there is an afterlife. And he seems to just keep reinforcing that through these uh, near death experiences. I believe that everybody goes to heaven, whether they're Christians or not. You and I are on the same mission. You are uh, getting people to tell their stories on the air. And I agree with you that these God's miracles did not just happen in biblical times. They are current and they happen all the time. All we have to do is look closer, pay attention. Thank you, Emily. Emily Rodovich, the name of her book, books actually, Mystical Interludes, one uh, with her experiences and the second book, of readers' experiences. Mystical interludes can be found at where? EmilyRodovich.com. Beautiful. Touched by Heaven moment. Beautiful near-death experiences by Karen Seberg and by Emily Rodovich. And we are never alone. Thank you for uh, thank you for not letting me be alone here just by myself. Thanks for being with me because, you know, I get so lonely. Uh, so thank you for that. Share your story with me, would you? If you have an experience, please, 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 I would appreciate it. Go to TouchedByHeaven.net. Contact me there. You know what fascinates me about these stories is how many affect the lukewarm and people who could care less about God and people who disdain God get these experiences. And then I was listening to Bishop Robert Barron this week. He does a kind of a homily podcast, and he says, uh, after somebody has an encounter, a, a mission is given. An impossible mission? No. It can feel like it at times, but a mission. He, he never said, now go back to your home and twiddle thy thumbs. There was no thumb twiddling in the Bible. Howard Storm, last I heard they're making a movie about his life. He uh, was a professor in Kentucky, an atheist, uh, hated God, hated the, hated the concept of God. He had a lovely atheist wife and their two atheist children, and uh, they were vacationing, I think, in Paris, and he got sick, some kind of perforation of the stomach, and he had a near-death experience. Did he see the white light in the tunnel and all that? No. What he experienced was he got out of his hospital bed as he was hearing voices in the hallway calling him, and he looks down at the hospital bed and he sees himself, and he walks out the hospital room, and there are these guys there, and they say, come on, Howard, they're waiting for us, let's go, let's go, let's go, and he's walking down the hallway, and pretty soon the walls of the hallway disappear, and now it's just him and the guys, and these aren't just any old guys. These are demons, the fallen angels. And I finally said to them, I'm not going with you any further. And they said, um, you have to go further. And they started to push and pull me. And I fought back. And 
We fought a very long time. I was trying to get them off me, but there were lots of them. And I was lying on the ground of that place, sort of in a fetal position. And people were coming by and kicking me, and um, I, didn't, I didn't even respond to it at all. And I heard a voice that sounded like it came from my chest. And it said, pray to God. And I thought, I don't pray. And the voice said, pray to God. And I thought, I haven't prayed. I don't even know how to pray. And the voice said, pray to God. And I thought, when I was a child, I'd gone to church and I'd learned prayers. And what were those prayers? And I'm trying to remember things. I started to mutter some things in an attempt to actually put together a prayer when the people around me became very angry and they were saying in very extreme obscene language that there is no God, nobody could hear me, and they were going to make things much worse for me if I didn't stop praying. And because it made them angry, and it also seemed to be driving them away from me. Um, that encouraged me to try and remember bits and pieces of prayer, which I began to shout at them. And in a very short while, I found that the only thing I could hear anymore was me yelling. And I couldn't, I had no sense that they were anywhere near. You could make the connection that the just the thought of God was driving them away. Yes, it was very evident. And you said the voice. Did you say from the from your chest? It felt like it was coming from your chest. Yes. Interesting. I mean, you think yeah. about hearing things in your ears, your mind, your head, not your chest. Yeah. What do you What do you make of that? Just. I think that, um, in a way, that was my soul speaking to me. You know, my, um, my intellect, which resides in my brain, was an atheist. But my spirit, which I don't know where the spirit resides. You know, I, I don't think they've ever quite located the exact location of our soul or our spirit. But that was like, listen to me, you idiot. <laughs> you know? Or was it trying to make the contact with your heart? Or, you know, yeah. like that's, yeah. that's, you know, go to that place that you haven't been to for a long time. You know? Right. Yeah. I came to the conclusion my wife was a complete failure as a man, a husband, a father, a son, um, a teacher, an artist in every way. I knew that I deserved to be in this place, but I didn't want to be in this place. And I certainly didn't want those people to come back because I knew that um, they had more processing to do with me. Would you call it an, an examination of conscience of sort? Do you feel like oh, that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, absolutely. In that state of complete despair and hopelessness, uh, memory came to the rescue, which was of myself as a child in a Sunday school classroom, singing Jesus Loves Me. And more critical was the fact that I felt what I had felt as a child, that there was this wonderful guy who I had no real understanding of, but just knew there was this great guy named Jesus who was God, son of God, who was always there, who I prayed to and who loved me and would protect me. And I wanted that. And I called out to him. And when I called out to him, he came. And the first thing I saw was a tiny little light in the darkness. And it got very big, very bright, very fast. And then it was right there, impossibly brilliant, more, more brilliant than like um, an arc welding light. I used to be a welder, so. Okay. You're still in fetal position of sorts. Yeah. Okay. And it came over me, and I saw in his light for the first time I saw me, and it was um, looked like roadkill. It was horrible. And his hands and arms came out from the light and reached down and touched me. And when he touched me, all the gore 
drifted away like it was just fine dust. And when he touched me, he filled me with a love which is indescribable. It's been the biggest source of frustration in my life, my inability to describe that love, because if I could describe that love, I would presume that everybody would find it so irresistible that they would want to connect to that love immediately without hesitation. He picked me up and hugged me and held me up against himself. And he rubbed my back. And I hugged him and I cried. And that's when I suddenly realized we were moving upward very slowly at first and then more rapidly and then very rapidly moving out of the darkness. And as I tried to regain my composure, because I was crying very hard, I looked where we were headed towards and I saw a world of light and felt more of the love that I was experiencing from Jesus. And all of a sudden I had this gigantic, uh oh, what a fool I've been. What a bad person I've been because I've denied God all my life. And now I'm going to heaven. And that's where God is. And I was afraid. And I thought, I'm such a piece of garbage. He's made a terrible mistake. And he said to me, by speaking to my mind, and I hadn't said anything. These were just my thoughts. Mm -hmm. He said to me, and to my mind, he said, we don't make mistakes. <laughs> <You belong." laughs> and I thought, how did he know that? Because I didn't say it. And he said, I know everything you think. And I said, oh, that's not good. And he said, actually, I know everything you've ever thought. And then I started thinking, oh, no, there are things that I've thought that I don't even want to acknowledge I've thought. <laughs> no. I mean, yeah. I've had lots of terrible thoughts. Yeah. Those are supposed to be private thoughts. No, nobody's supposed yeah. to know those things. Yeah. 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 And he laughed and thought that was really funny. And he said, <laughs> it's okay. And I, I began to realize that he didn't just love me. He really, really cared about me and liked me a lot. I also came to realize when we did my life review that he hated the things that I had done in my life, but he never hated me. He always loved me. So that saying that we have in the church god hates the sin but loves the sinner yeah that's true of jesus very 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 true and uh so after a while he told me that he had uh, people that he wanted me to meet and he called out and some people surrounded by different kinds of light came and hovered now we we're not in the world of dark and we're not in the world of light. We're outside the world of light, basically, and or heaven. And uh, these people are hovering around me, and he explained that they had recorded my life and they wanted to show me my life. So we watched my life in chronological order from birth to the present. And after we went through the um, childhood stage, which was fun, it became increasingly difficult because I saw myself turning away from God and compassion and love and becoming more and more um, successful and cruel and manipulative and self-centered. And not only did it displease Jesus and the angels, it actually hurt them. Physically, so, emotionally. I mean, you just got yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. it, I, this is a crude analogy, but here I am being held by Jesus, who's re rescued me from this hellish place. And we're watching my life, and it's like I'm stabbing him in the heart with a dagger. And I'm, you know, all you can keep saying is, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know? Mm -hmm. I mean. Yeah, you feel like you're killing him. Yeah. Yeah. 
um, because he's a very um, passionate person. One of the uh, interesting things about Jesus is he's he's very passionate. You know, he he laughs, he cries, he um, um, got very strong feelings. And of course, that's um, evident in the uh, Gospels, too. And uh, when that was over, which I was had asked many times for it to be over, because I got really um, embarrassed about my life, was um, he said, do you have any questions? And I said, I have a million questions. And so he said, ask whatever you want. Every I asked him about the past, the present, the future. Lots of questions about me. Lots of questions about the Bible. Okay. Lots of questions about Jesus. He was a very um, kind and patient teacher, best teacher I've ever had. You know, Jesus is great commandment, love one another. Um, that's what he told me to do, you know. Um, I mean, he made it clear to me that God wants everyone to go to heaven. Unfortunately, um, there's a lot of people that don't want to go there. If they knew, you know, if they knew, what, if they had your experience, maybe... You think they'd get it? Because I mean, look what he turned. Look at look how he turned you around. I I would. I mean, if I ran the world, if you if you made me tyrant to the world, I would. Um, anyone that didn't accept Jesus as the Lord and the Savior, I would put them in a torture chamber until they confess Jesus. <laughs> well, what I'm a kidding. sweet thing to say, Howard. <laughs> <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, uh, because that's not. I mean, that's not how he wants us to come. <laughs> Have you learned nothing, Howard? <laughs> I know, I know. Yeah, but you've had this incredibly, I mean, I, you're like a reformed smoker now. It's like, oh, yeah. please, you want to shake people and go, come, are you kidding me? You know, it's, it, That's what yeah. you are, you know. Exactly. What a great experience. Okay, now then, uh, let's go back a second here. These these beings that came in, and I don't know if they were holding up screens or how they did this exactly to show you your life. Angels? People? Yes. Angels? Yes. They look like angels, as we think of angels? Well, they were beautiful, and they were surrounded in light. At one point, they asked me if I wanted to see um, their human form, and I said no. I told them that I hate people. I never want to see people again. Hmm. Okay. Uh, so you see your life. The, you're asking questions. Um, okay, go, uh, where, where do we go next? I finally said to him, I want to go to heaven. He had... We had talked a lot about heaven. He had shown me things about heaven. And, of course, heaven's the, the no-brainer choice for anyone with a molecule of consciousness should know that. And um, he said, no, you're not. it's not your time to go to heaven. You're not fit to go to heaven. You have to come back to the world and live the way you were created to be in the first place. And he and I had a really big argument, and I argued as forcefully and as passionately as I could to go to heaven, and he countered my arguments with better arguments about why that wasn't going to happen. And um, Ultimately, I had to accept that, and I agreed that I would come back to this world. I asked him, um, I said, if I go back to the world, what do you want me to do? And he said, love the person that you're with. And I said, yeah, but what do you want me to do? And he said, that's what I want you to do. And I said, that's it. And he said, yep, that's it. He said, and then he said the thing that really settled me. He said, if you do that, that'll change the world. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't, I said, <laughs> you're a, you're a trip, Howard. You're a trip. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> but but you know it's it's funny because it sounds simple doesn't it it sounds yeah, simple it's, it just seemed too simple it's like how how can loving people change the world and he explained to me that it was god's plan but just and as he was in the moment with you that's how we're supposed to be with everybody to be in the moment with them loving that person right yeah that's and and that is that is not that's not real easy sometimes no, I thought it was going to be so easy, and I've been working on this for almost 30 years now, and uh, I mess up all the time. I get so frustrated with myself. We all do. We all do. And I, I want to live there with you. I want to go there. I want to, I want to see that movie. I want to see you yeah. and Jesus and the angels 
in that moment and, f yeah. and see what you saw and felt. But the problem was like when I saw my wife on Sunday morning, which was the, the next morning, I tried to tell her what had happened to me. And um, it was very evident to me that she wasn't believing a word I was saying. She just thought I was um, in La La Land somewhere. And I knew it was going to be a really big problem. And it has been an interesting problem because um, many people have um, hurt me with their criticism of me, telling me I'm crazy. People who knew Just, you b before you're talking about? Friends, that kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Family. Yeah. I've lost. That wife eventually left me, which broke my heart. Um did her best to turn our two children against me. Um, all of my friends at the university wanted nothing to do with me. I was a, a full professor and a department head, Northern Kentucky University. Okay, that had to hurt. Yeah, you were so actually, you were ostracized. You were you were you were out there in the weird land. You know. Yeah, and I, I of course as soon as I was able, I started going to church, and I just fell in love with the church. Because the reason why I fell in love with the church because uh, I realized it was a great place for sinners. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. I was afraid. I was afraid to go to church because I thought it was like a, a museum of saints. And then when I found out that it was a room full of sinners, <laughs> I like, hey, I fit right in. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> yep. <laughs> and I've, I've I've been a member of that church um, all my life. But anyways, I, I um, got very involved in. The work of the church and eventually um, realized that God had a call on me to give my life to the church. So um, I left the university and went to seminary for three and a half years and became an ordained pastor, which I did for 22 years, served churches for 22 years. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Which brain? United Church of Christ. Okay. Uh, for believers, what are the theories? Where you went? What, what happened? G give me the theories of believers. I've gotten the whole range from people being very supportive um, to people saying it couldn't possibly have happened. God doesn't work that way. And that it was a delusion. Um, Even amongst believers. Yeah. God doesn't work that way because they know this how. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've had, I had a person write me and tell me it couldn't have happened because God doesn't resurrect anybody. And went, oh, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. A new theory on Christianity. <laughs> um, I didn't write him back because I didn't know where we could begin our conversation. Right. Well, my Catholic friends, of course, have a perfect explanation, which is purgatory. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, and that doesn't sit. A, that doesn't sit a, with you. I'm a Protestant. And right. It's not not something we studied in seminary. You know, we didn't right. ever talk about purgatory because I went to a Methodist seminary. I I know where I was, and I was being processed for eternal damnation in hell. Whether I was in hell or entering hell or in pre hell, you know, immaterial. I mean. No, you wouldn't want you wouldn't want um, the worst person in the world to go to that place. Right. And I know that where I was was not the really bad part. I was just being prepped. But I think that God had plans for me. I think God, in His um, terrific sense of humor, said, "I'm going to take this atheist and turn him around, and he's a big mouth, and he's going to tell people all about my plan for them." <laughs> to go to heaven. And that'll be really funny. It shows God's love for us, Jesus' love for us, that he will go after an atheist. He'll go after that lost sheep so yeah. hard, so yeah. hard. Right. Even after we die, we still have a shot. The Bible says in three places, anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that describes what happened to me. Um, he's the not only the uh, best friend that I have, but the the um, the love and the kindness of God all wrapped up in my best friend. It's, he's a really um, he's a really great person to have in my life. Out of desperation, I called on Jesus, 
And he did not disappoint me, and he's never disappointed me since. 